Well, would you grab hold of your Bible this morning, and would you open your Bible up to the book of Joshua? We're going to be in Joshua chapter 10 this morning. Sermon text is Joshua chapter 10. We're going to start in verse 16, and we're going to read through verse 43. Joshua chapter 10, starting in verse 16, hear the word of our God. These five kings fled and hid themselves in the cave at Makeda, and it was told to Joshua, the five kings have been found hiding in the cave at Makeda. And Joshua said, roll large stones against the mouth of the cave and set men by it to guard them. But do not stay there yourselves. Pursue your enemies. Attack their rear guard. Do not let them enter their cities, for the Lord your God has given them into your hand. When Joshua and the sons of Israel had finished striking them with a great blow until they were wiped out, and when the remnant that remained of them had entered into the fortified cities, then all the people returned safe to Joshua in the camp at Makeda. Not a man moved his tongue against any of the people of Israel. Then Joshua said, open the mouth of the cave and bring those five kings out to me from the cave. And they did so and brought those five kings out to him from the cave, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon. And when they brought these kings out to Joshua, Joshua summoned all the men of Israel and said to the chiefs of the men of war who had gone with him, Come near, put your feet on the necks of these kings. And they came near and put their feet on their necks. And Joshua said to them, Do not be afraid or dismayed. Be strong and courageous, for thus the Lord will do to all your enemies against whom you fight. And afterward Joshua struck them and put them to death, and he hanged them on five trees, and they hung on trees until evening. But at the time of the going down of the sun, Joshua commanded, and they took them down from the trees and threw them into the cave where they had hidden themselves, and they set large stones against the the mouth of the cave, which remain there to this very day. As for Makeda, Joshua captured it on that day and struck it and its king with the edge of the sword. He devoted to destruction every person in it. He left none remaining, and he did to the king of Makeda just as he had done to the king of Jericho. Then Joshua and all Israel with him passed on from Makeda to Libna and fought against Libna. And the Lord gave it also and its king into the hand of Israel, and he struck it with the edge of the sword and every person in it. He left none remaining in it, and he did to its king as he had done to the king of Jericho. Then Joshua and all Israel with him passed on from Libna to, to Lachish and laid siege to it and fought against it. And the Lord gave Lachish into the hand of Israel, and he captured it on the second day. And struck it with the edge of the sword and every person in it, as he had done to Libna. Then Horem, king of Gezer, came up to help Lachish, and Joshua struck him and his people until he left none remaining. Then Joshua and all Israel with him passed on from Lachish to Eglon, and they laid siege to it and fought against it, and they captured it on that day and struck it with the edge of the sword, and he devoted every person in it to destruction that day as he had done to Lachish. And Joshua and all Israel with him went up from Eglon to Hebron, and they fought against it and captured it and struck it with the edge of the sword and its king and its towns and every person in it. He left none remaining as he had done to Eglon and devoted it to destruction and every person in it. Then Joshua and all Israel with him turned back to Debir and fought against it. He captured it with its king and all its towns, and they struck them down with the edge of the sword and devoted to destruction every person in it. He left none remaining just as he had done to Hebron and to Libna and its king. So he did to Debir and and to its king. And so Joshua struck the whole land, the hill country and the Negev, the lowland and the slopes, and all their kings. He left none remaining but devoted to destruction, all that breathed just as the Lord God of Israel commanded. And Joshua struck them from Kadesh Barnea as far as Gaza and all the country of Goshen as far as Gibeon. 
And Joshua captured all these kings and their land at one time because the Lord God of Israel fought for Israel. Then Joshua returned and all Israel with him to the camp at Gilgal. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we are so thankful that you are a God who speaks and we can hear you this morning. We're so thankful for the book of Joshua and the help it gives us. And we pray this morning as we look into Joshua chapter 10 that you would open our eyes so that we might see you at work. And we pray that as we see you, that you would be pleased to build our hearts up in faith. Would you do this for us, we pray in your son's name. Amen. Well, we are, as we think about it, we are Christ's people. We're Jesus' people, and as Christ's people, we have a calling. And as Christ's people, we are called to be a confident people. The Bible talks about this in different ways, but if you survey your Bible, you find that we are, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, we are called to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. We are to stand firm in the faith. We are to act like men and to be strong. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13. We must, according to the Apostle Paul in Colossians chapter 1, verse 23, continue in the faith, being both stable and steadfast. Or to use the words that we've already heard so many times in the book of Joshua, for example, Joshua chapter 1 verse 7, be strong and and very courageous. We are, as Christ's people, called to be confident. And confidence, if confidence is our calling, we must then put away certain behaviors and, and certain attitudes, Certain attitudes and behaviors that don't fit with this calling of confidence. And so the Bible comes to us and is motivating us. We get Hebrews 12, verses 12 through 13. The author of Hebrews encourages us. He says, lift your drooping hands and and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet. The Bible works on us, it digs into our hearts, and it speaks to us. Isaiah 35, verse 4, say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong and fear not. And the Bible reminds us of who we are in God, in Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. And here we know the, bio, the book of Joshua has something to say to us. The book of Joshua has commanded, Joshua chapter 1, verse 9, do not be frightened and, and do not be dismayed. We are, as Christ's people, called to be confident. Now, as we think about this calling and as we think about this word confidence, we realize that confidence is not something unique to Christianity. You just go on YouTube or go searching around among podcasts and you will find a a universal concern for this matter of confidence. Especially in our day, both men and women are searching and trying to figure out how to stand up on their own two feet and face the world or or better yet, trying to, to face, try to face yourself. Learning how to put away doubt, learning how to overcome insecurities learning how to stand up and be strong and have stability to be confident. But as we think about it, and as we think about our calling in Christ, there is something unique about Christianity that is different than the world. And the big difference is how one goes about becoming confident, gaining confidence. If you spend any time listening to these cultural commentators, the the strategy, by and large, for gaining confidence has to do with the self. And so advice ranges from accepting yourself and growing more comfortable with yourself to improving and building up, strengthening yourself. Sometimes advice comes like, well, maybe if you you dress nicer or if you lose some weight and, and put on some muscle, you'll gain confidence. Maybe you'll be strong. Maybe you'll be stable. Now, of course, there's a kernel of truth in 
what some of these people say. Of course, no one's going to dispute the goodness of exercise or the goodness of a, a wise diet or the wisdom of dressing appropriately. But here we have to think hard and, and understand that the Bible offers us a completely different strategy for gaining confidence. The Bible comes to us and offers us a completely different path to gain stability and strength and courage and all these other words that make up what confidence is. And so if the Bible offers us a different path to confidence, we ask, well, what, what is that path? What does it look like for me to gain confidence in the Lord? Well, I think the Scottish pastor, Robert Murray McShane, perfectly captures the Bible's strategy. And so in a letter that he wrote, he, he put this down, and I want to read to you this paragraph. So just pay attention to what he says, and listen to, listen to how he describes how a Christian is to grow up. And so he says, he begins with a, a dour note, but it gets good. He says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Learn much of the Lord Jesus. For every look at yourself, take ten looks at Christ. He is altogether lovely. Such infinite majesty and yet such meekness and grace and all for sinners, even the chief. Live in the smiles of God. Bask in his beams. Feel his all-seeing eye settled on you in love. Let your soul be filled with a heart-ravishing sense of the sweetness and the excellence of Christ and all that is in him. Let the Holy Spirit fill every chamber of your heart and so there will be no more room for folly or the world or Satan or the flesh. Do you hear what McShane is saying? Do you see the strategy that he's employing for the Christian life? Do you see the difference between the, the two paths, a worldly path and the, the biblical path? One path proposes a self-focus for the gaining of confidence. The other path that McShane talks about talks about the, the abandonment of sinful self. One path for the sake of confidence sets a mirror and calls you to, to look in the mirror and gaze upon the self. But the other path proposes something completely different. The other path says, for every look at yourself, take ten looks at Christ. One path calls us to get comfortable with ourselves. The other path calls us to look at the excellency and the majesty of the Lord Jesus one path points to the Savior within, but the other points to the Savior without who must come in and then fill every chamber of our heart with his life-giving spirit. You see the difference between these two paths. They're radically different. Now, this path that Robert Murray McShane articulated for us, and he, he does it so well, Shouldn't be, shouldn't be new to us. It shouldn't be a surprise to us because we have seen this path modeled for us in the book of Joshua. Just remember how the story began in Joshua chapter 1. In Joshua chapter 1, the Lord came to Joshua and three times called Joshua to strength and courage, or if we put a different word on that, the Lord is coming to Joshua and he's commanding Joshua to be confident. Be confident. And we ask, well, how did, how did the Lord get that done? How did the Lord make Joshua's heart confident? How did the Lord make him stable and secure, courageous and bold? Well, we certainly know what the Lord didn't do with Joshua. He didn't call Joshua to look at himself or even really consider himself. No, we see the opposite happening. Essentially, the Lord comes to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1 and he says, take 10 looks at me happening? What does the Lord do? He comes to Joshua and he says, Joshua, look up at my purpose and my promise. Joshua chapter 1 verse 3, the Lord says, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you. And the Lord goes on, the Lord points to his faithful presence and his almighty power. Chapter 1 verse 5, the Lord says, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. 
And we see the Lord dealing with Joshua, calling him to confidence, and the source of Joshua's confidence is to be the Lord himself. The Lord is saying, take ten looks at me. And what's interesting is we move into Joshua chapter 10, Joshua is going to turn to the men of Israel and do a similar work with all of the men of Israel. He is going to turn to them and he's going to begin working for their confidence in the Lord. And he's going to do this with the simple strategy of this. He's going to say, brothers, if we summarize chapter 10, take 10 looks at the Lord. Take 10 looks at the Lord. And if we're careful to listen to Joshua chapter 10, we're going to find that happening to us. We're going to find Joshua turning to us and telling us to look at the Lord. And as we find ourselves looking at the Lord, we will find God doing this great work in our hearts. He will find, we will find ourselves growing confident in the Lord, his purpose and his promise. And so we're going to work through chapter 10. We worked through the beginning portion of this last week, and we'll finish it off this week. And, and we'll see in verses 16 through 43, three chunks of text. And so first of all, in our, our range of verses, we see a concluding scene. Second, we see an itemized list. And third, we see this, this sweeping summary. And so we'll start with the concluding scene we get in verses 16 through 43. And so here in Joshua chapter 10, we're picking up the story that we were hearing last week. And so here as we pick up the story, we find the confederation of the Amorites in tatters. And they are in tatters because the Lord, the Lord has entered into the field of battle. Let me remind you what the Lord did. The Lord panicked the armies of the Amorites. And then the Lord came and he struck them with a great blow. The Lord chased them. Do you remember that? The Lord's on the battlefield and he's giving chase to these armies and these kings. The Lord goes up into the heavenly places and then he throws down giant hailstones, killing the Amorites, more Amorites than Israel could kill with the sword. We heard even that the Lord stopped the sun and the moon in their place so that this battle could continue on. And as we look at our text, all that is left to do for Israel is a bunch of mopping up. They need to clean up this big mess of a battle. And so in verse 17, we're informed that the five kings of the Amorites, we've got Adonai Zedek and his co-conspirators, we've got Hoham, Piram, Japhia, and Debir, that these five kings, they go and hide themselves in a cave. So these kings have been soundly defeated on the field of battle, and here they are shamed. This word that Joshua uses is the word that's used in Genesis chapter 3 to describe Adam and Eve after they sin. What did they do? They went and hid themselves. And these Amorite kings are doing the same thing. They go hide themselves in a cave. Then in verses 20 through 21, we hear the news that the armies of these five kings have been wiped out. And only a few survivors are left from this battle, and they run off, they scurry, and they hide themselves in cities. And so great is this victory that was won this day in Joshua chapter 10, that the spirit of the Canaanites in in the south, just broken, demolished. We get this in verse 21, the text says, not a man moved his tongue against any of the people of Israel. They're not moving their swords against Israel for sure, but now they're even scared to to speak against the people of Israel. So great is the victory of the Lord. And so with this news reported, it is here that the text now slows down and pauses. The battle is won. The armies have been routed. The kings are hiding themselves in a cave and are, are captured. And here the, the text just stops us and the text says, look. Just look. And what do we see when we look? Well, just, just look here. What does Joshua do? Well, he brings out the five captured kings. 
And just imagine them in your mind. Picture them in your mind. These were important men. These were great men. Men who ruled over cities and towns. Men who had armies and commanded them on the battlefield. Perhaps these kings, these five kings, had kingly regalia on. Perhaps they had crowns upon their heads and jewels on their fingers and, and stately robes on. Or maybe because there was a battle, maybe they had the garb of a warrior on. Perhaps they had the best instruments of war out of all the warriors. Perhaps they had great swords and spears and helmets and shields. And so here are these great kings, all five of them, and Joshua brings them out. And what does Joshua do to these five kings? Well, he does this. He humiliates them. Joshua makes them lie down prostrate on the ground. So that means that their faces would have been in the dirt, lying flat. It means that Joshua would have shoved their noses right down into the dust. And then what does Joshua do? Well, he gathers all the men of Israel and he brings forward the chiefs of his officers and he commands them, verse 24, he says, come near, put your feet on the necks of those kings. Just imagine the scene, these, these kings in their glory are humiliated and then Joshua says, come men, take your feet and put them on the neck and squish the life out of them. <laughs> what a scene. What a scene. Now this might seem gruesome and barbaric to you, maybe it seems completely unnecessary to you, but, but we have to notice the rich symbolism What is Joshua doing? He's using this dramatic display to to demonstrate the truth of what has happened for Israel. They, the people of God, are literally treading down their enemies. And Joshua comes and he invites the leaders of God's people to share in Israel's exaltation over these wicked, rebellious kings. Joshua knows that the Lord is giving them the victory and he, he asks these leaders to come and participate in this victory of the Lord. So we need to keep thinking about this scene. We have it pictured in our minds. What does Joshua want this to do for all of Israel? How does he want this to function in the hearts of God's people? And so we see this in verse 24, and now we need to listen to verse 25. Joshua keeps speaking, and he says this. Do not be afraid or be dismayed. Be strong and courageous, for thus the Lord will do to all your enemies against whom you fight. And so just put the pieces of the puzzle together. Here is Joshua, and he's carefully choreographing this whole scene that Israel might see it. He he brings out these kings in their splendor, and then he humiliates them, and he brings forward the chiefs of his men, and he has them stand on their necks, treading them down into the dirt. And why does Joshua do this? Well, he does it so that Israel might look upon the power and the purpose of the Lord. You see, this isn't an ego-inflating exercise. Joshua doesn't preach to Israel. Well, look at what you've done here. Look at how strong you are or how wise you are. Look at your goodness here. No, what is Joshua doing? He is preaching a message with this visual display. He is saying, look at what the Lord has done for you. And consider this, the Lord will do this thing again and again and again. So be confident in the Lord. Don't fear, don't fret. This is your God. He is giving you the victory. He is the great warrior. And you don't need to fear. He will win the battle. And guess what? You will tread upon more kings. All of the kings of the land. So there we see the first chunk of the text. We see this concluding scene as Israel treads down the the kings in the south of Canaan. So we can move on to the second chunk that we see in Joshua chapter 10. And we find an itemized list in Joshua chapter 10. And so the Amorite armies have been wiped out. The, The five kings have been captured and Joshua executes them and and puts them on stakes in the open sun, and later they are, are buried, thrown rubble upon them, and thrown into a cave. And so with all of this happening, Joshua is wise. 
he advances Israel's cause when there is weakness. And so Joshua pushes the army of Israel into the southern parts of the land of Canaan. And so Joshua goes to Makeda and he captures the city and, and kills the king all in a single day. He then goes to Lebanon and he does the same thing to its city and its king. And from, from there he goes to Lachish and, and then he takes the city in two days. And in the process of capturing this city, uh, another king comes up and tries to help, Horam, the king of Gezer. And Joshua wipes out this king and, and his army. And then Joshua keeps marching. He keeps making progress. He goes to Eglon and in a single day takes the city. And then he goes to Hebron and he repeats the same thing. And then finally the, the campaign in the south of Canaan comes to an end after Joshua takes and destroys the city of Debir. Debir. So what we find in Joshua chapter 10 verses 28 through 39 is a list. And if you think about this list, we've read the whole of it this morning already. It's a repetitive list. In this list, we get some geographical data. We hear of city after city after city after city, told a few scant details about the battle. Sometimes there's a siege, like a two-day siege. Sometimes these cities are just completely overwhelmed, it seems, in a moment. Sometimes there's battle on the open fields. So we get some details about the battle. We're told about the judgment of the Lord each time in this list. Israel is the Lord's executioner carrying out his just judgment. And so we hear these words again and again. For example, and he struck the edge of the sword and every person in it. He left none remaining in it. And so we have this list. So what are we to make of this list? If we're being honest, this list is not that exciting for Bible reading. These verses are probably verses you haven't lingered over meditating on them, trying to draw out all the truth from them. I mean, just think about it. When you're reading your Bible and you're working through your Bible reading plan and you come to a list, what do you usually do? Well, your eyes start to skip around. You're, you start looking. When does this list come to an end? How long am I going to have to endure this list? What comes next after this list? But I think there's, there's riches in this list. Just consider this list and all these details we get in this list from a different angle. Imagine that you are in the camp at Gilgal. All the men of war have gone out into the south of Canaan. They are making war. And you're in the camp and day after day reports come in. Joshua is sending heralds back to the camp to let everyone know what's going on. And so on the first day, a messenger runs into the camp and with a loud voice, he, he yells at the top of his lungs, Makeda has fallen. And the people, they, they cheer. You're, you're glad the Lord is giving victory. And the next day comes and more good news. Messenger comes and he proclaims, Libna has fallen. And the news keeps coming again and again and again. You hear that Lachish has fallen. The Horem king of Gezer has been defeated on the field of battle. You hear about Eglon and, and Hebron and Debir. City after city, you hear the news. It's coming to you day after day. And what would this news do for you? What would it do to your soul? Well, I think it would wash over you like waves. One wave after another after another. And as all this news washed over you, I think you would probably do something like this. I think you would remember that scene with the five kings. I think you'd probably remember that scene when Joshua takes out those five kings and he, he puts them down on their faces and you see the, the chiefs of the men of Israel treading them down with their feet on their necks. I think you'd probably recall Joshua's words that you heard as he spoke as he called out with a loud voice, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. Be strong and courageous for thus the Lord will do to all your enemies against whom you fight. And you probably would say something in your head, maybe something to the person standing next to you. You might say, it's true. It's so gloriously true. The Lord is the great warrior, and I do not need to fear or be dismayed. I can be strong and courageous for Yahweh, our great God. He is fighting for us. I know it. Look at the truth of it. All of these cities have fallen. No one could stand against our God. 
And so there's the second chunk of text. We get this itemized list. And we can come to the third chunk of chapter 10, and that's this sweeping summary at the end. And so in verses 28 through 39, we get this itemized list. And as you think about it, information comes to us piece by piece, bit by bit. But in verses 40 through 43, this summary, we get something different. The text wants us to to wrap our arms around the totality of all that's been accomplished in the south of Canaan. And the summary does this work, helping us wrap our arms around all that the Lord has done by repeating the word all. If you look at these verses, you will see that in verses 40 through 43, the the word all is repeated five times. We see it first used in verse 40. It says, Joshua struck all the land, or if you're reading the ESV, it says, he struck the whole of the land. And what does the text want us to do? The text wants us to lift up our eyes and look up and look out and scan the horizon. It wants us to look out to the hill country and to the, to the western foothills. It wants us to look out to the far south, to the, to the Negev. It wants us to look out to the, to the mountains. So the effect is this. Wherever you look in the south, you scan over here, you scan over there, you look out way down there. What do you see? You see victory. You see victory. And this point is reiterated with another use of all as it's applied to geography. Verse 41. Joshua struck them from Kadesh Barnea as far as Gaza and all the country of Goshen as far as Gibeon. And then there's more alls. We find these alls in a cluster about battle. Look at verse 40. Joshua struck all their kings. He left none remaining but devoted to destruction all that breathed. Go down to verse 42. And Joshua captured all these kings and their land at one time. As we come to the summary and we hear this word repeated again and again and again, all, 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 all. And it's the author of Joshua is just driving this point home. Everyone in the south, every people group, every king in the south has been overcome by Joshua and the people of Israel. And what's the takeaway here? What does this mean? Well, look at verse 42 because the point is plain. Here's the significance of all of this. The text says, The Lord God of Israel fought for Israel. The Lord God of Israel fought for Israel. The takeaway is this, the Lord. He is with his people. He is for his people. He is fighting. He is fighting. And so there we have the whole of chapter 10 in front of us. We've worked through the three chunks of text. We started by pausing and considering this dramatic conclusion to this war with the five Amorite kings. We see them humiliated. We see the chiefs of Israel treading upon their necks. We move to the second chunk of text and we find this itemized list. We follow Joshua around the south of Canaan, moving from city to city, conquering and winning. And then we get this sweeping summary and we are, are, the text wants us to stand up and look out and just consider the, the totality of the Lord's victories for his people. And here with this all in front of us, we can ask, well, what is the result of all of this? What's the result of Joshua chapter 10? And as we think about it, these t- chunks of text are, are so different. One chunk of text moves so slow. Another text moves like a blitz. It's just moving fast, here to here to here to here. One text focused on gruesome details. And then the next focuses on geography. But even though these texts are vastly different, they're all serving the same exact end. Each chunk here is pointing up and away from the people of Israel, pointing away from self and pointing to the Lord God, the one who fights for his people. You see what Joshua chapter 10 is doing? It wants its reader, after working through all of this material, it wants its reader to be looking up and staring right at the Lord. And as we think about it, Joshua chapter 10 serves us so well. Brother, sister, if we are going to live out our calling, if we're going to be stable and steadfast, 
us, if we're going to be immovable and firm, if we are going to be confident in the Lord, or if we're going to use the words of Joshua, if we're going to be strong and courageous, we need to see the God of Joshua chapter 10. I think it would be wise here just to stop for a moment and just run a simple diagnostic in light of Joshua chapter 10, employing the logic of Joshua chapter 10 to ourselves. And it goes like this. Those who are most confident in the Lord are those who have seen much of the Lord. Those who are most confident in the Lord are those who have seen much of the Lord. And the opposite is true. Those who are most paralyzed by fear and trouble and anxiety are those who have seen little of the Lord. So we can say, seeing more of the Lord does what? It creates confidence. If you see the Lord, you're going to grow in courage and strength and stability But if you're not seeing the Lord, it's going to leave a void in your soul and fear and trouble and anxiety is going to take hold of you and grab you. See how that's working. Seeing Lord creates confidence. Not seeing him leaves a void and creates trouble. So what does this mean for us? Well, it means this. Wherever you fall on the spectrum, so maybe you're growing confident in the Lord. You, you feel the stability in your life. Or maybe you're, you're wrestling with fear and anxiety. Wherever you're at on this spectrum, your need is this. You need to see more of the Lord. You need to see more of this God. And, and hear this piece of good news. There is so much to see of the Lord. If we think about Joshua chapter 10, this is just an appetizer of what is to come in Scripture. It's just a small little taste of who the Lord is. In fact, from our vantage point, think about it, we have the complete canon of Scripture. We have all of it. And from our vantage point, our seeing of the Lord is is clearer and, and fuller. Our view of the Lord is so much more vivid and has color and depth and texture. There's so much more of the Lord for us to see than what there is in Joshua chapter 10. And just look with me for a moment, for this is the path to confidence. Just look with me for a moment. When we look, what do we see? We see the Lord close up. In the pages of the gospel, our God is not far away, but we see our God incarnate. John chapter 1, verse 14. John says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. We can see our God close. Because we can see our God close, we see our Lord in manifold detail. Think about what we see of our Lord in the Gospels. We see our Lord in his power, battling against Satan and demons. We see him subduing disease and illness. We see him ruling over creation, over winds and waves. In fact, we see him up close, upholding the whole universe by the word of his power. Hebrews 1.3. We see the pages of the gospel in his mercy and in his gentleness dealing so kindly with those who deserve no kindness at all. We see him in his patience dealing ever so kindly as he teaches the ignorant the way of life. And we see him. We see him forgiving sins again and again and again. Even more, we see our Lord in all stations of his We see our Lord in his humiliation. We see our Lord weary and worn. We see our Lord rejected and abused. We see him as Isaiah once saw him from afar. Isaiah said he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. See our Lord in utter humiliation. We see him dead upon a cross. We see him buried in a tomb. But we also see our Lord in glory. We see him in resurrection. We see him as the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of kings on earth. We see him as Stephen once saw him. Do you remember what Stephen saw as he was being stoned and killed? He said, behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. 
Even more from, from our, our perspective from the book of Hebrews and 1 John, we, we see him in his heavenly station, seated and working. We see him as our advocate and friend. We see him in the innermost part of the heavenly sanctuary, bearing us up in earnest supplication. We see him in glory, seated on a throne, his feet lifted up, and all things being put underneath his feet as a footstool. We see him ruling and reigning over absolutely everything for our good. And here's something that boggles our minds. In Scripture, we can see Jesus in the future. And when we look to the future through the perspective that the Scriptures give us, we see him as the coming warrior of God and the end-time judge. We see him as John saw him in Revelation chapter 19. John says... Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which he will strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty, and on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. We get to see him even now. And brothers and sisters, there's so much to see of the Lord, isn't there? There is a lifetime of seeing him. And get this, this is the only path to biblical confidence, looking upon the Lord. And so we can close with this. This is our call, a call you, you must obey. It's the message of Joshua chapter 10. Robert Murray McShane said it best. He says, for every look at yourself, Take 10 looks at Christ. Take 10 looks at Christ and you will find confidence growing in your soul. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we are so thankful for your word and what we get to see in your word. In Joshua chapter 10, we get to look upon you in your glory as you fight for your people. And we're so thankful that that's just a small sampling of what we can see. And so we plead this morning, would you give us eyes of faith that we might look and look and look and see. Oh, Father, grant us sight that we might grow up in confidence in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.